is a five-part series. We're calling this series Passing Over. And what we're doing is laying the foundation to help you understand the philosophy of spiritual formation here at Family First. You see, we believe that God wants all of His people to process through four steps of spiritual development. We call it our philosophy for spiritual formation. And I'm going to keep saying these four things. Yes, thank you, Paul. We need to tell the middle schoolers to pass out. I mean, don't like fall but just pass out the, the, the hallway here and they'll be teaching the, the middle school. Some of you missed that. They'll be teaching the ministry to the middle schoolers. Thank you for reminding me about that. But we want you to know that God wants you to process through four steps in your spiritual formation. And nobody has started screaming right out loud in the middle of service, no, pastor, please don't say those four things again. Please, if I hear those four things again, I'm gonna scream. Since nobody's been doing that, I'm just going to keep on telling you these four things. God wants every one of you, number one, to know him, to know God. He wants you, number two, to find freedom in your life. He wants you, number three, to discover your God-ordained purpose. And he wants you, number four, then, to make a difference in the lives of others. So this series is an attempt to get you to understand that process and work through those four steps. Pastor Meredith and Pastor uh, Omar have taught messages partnering with me in this series. We're calling it passing over because we're tying it to the concept of Passover. Passover that happens around the Easter season is the celebration in Israel where every year they commemorate God bringing them out of Egyptian slavery. How many know that story? Bible says that when God wanted to bring Israel out of Egyptian persecution, God raised up a deliverer. His name was Moses. He went to the Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. And the Pharaoh said, no. <laughs> and so Moses said, well, God is going to bring Bring plagues upon the nation of Egypt and every one of the plagues was going to soften the Pharaoh's heart so that he would let the people go every plague he said okay I'm going to let you go and then just before he let them go he changed his mind because he didn't want to lose three and a half million slave laborers baking bricks and building the pyramids of Egypt so the final the, the final uh, culminating plague was the death angel was going to pass through the land but God said upon you and your house if you will take the blood of a Passover lamb and apply it to the doorposts and the mantles of your home that night when the death angel goes to the land of Egypt and the firstborn of man and animal will all be perished. If the blood has been applied, he will pass over and there will be no destruction that came to your house. So that celebration is remembered annually among the children of Israel and they celebrate it in what they call the traditional Seder Passover meal. How many are familiar with that? And in the Seder meal, in the Seder celebration, there are actually four cups not just one cup. When Jesus in the New Testament said, this is my body, which is for you. And after supper, go ahead and put that verse up. Chapter 22 of Luke, verse number 17. Look at this. This is what Jesus said. He took a cup. Now this is mute, but it's important. He didn't take the cup. He took a cup because there was one of four cups. There were four cups that were part of the Passover. And the scholars tell us that if you go through the different narratives of the Gospels, you can actually find and piece together all four of the different cups that Jesus shared with his disciples. But our point is that you can see in each of these four promises of Passover tied to one of God's original intense for you in the spiritual formation. For example, the first cup of Passover, and I like to say this, I'm not trying to impress you by pronouncing Hebrew words. I just think they sound cool. So if you do the research, the first cup of Passover, the first cup was called the Kaddish cup. Now to speak Hebrew, you got to have like something in the back of your throat, you know, a little sinus drainage, a, a little nasal drip helps a little bit. So this is the Kaddish cup. And this was the cup of sanctification. This is the introduction to the Passover. It was the start of the meal. They called it the cup of sanctification, but we've taken that to speak of what? Salvation. Because God wants everybody to know him. Now the second cup of the Seder Passover was the Haggadah <laughs> cup. I exaggerated that a little bit. The Haggadah cup. And that word means legend. 
That word means story. So what that was all about, God wanted them to use this cup to proclaim the story to their children, to people that came along in years after that didn't know about this story. And so every year in the Passover Seder celebration, they would say, this is what God did to us or for us. And they would give them the history of the 10 plagues. And they'd say, God brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. They called the Haggadah cup, the cup of deliverance. And Pastor Omar preached about this last week and we learned about what we learned about freedom the third cup that one we're going to talk about today is the barak cup and that word means blessing this cup follows the grace after the meal and it's the cup that we're going to talk about today in great detail it was called the cup of redemption here's your first fill in the blank i want you to get this which to us means restoration say that word with me restoration now the fourth cup The final cup we'll talk about next week is the Hallel cup. That means praise. And this cup included the singing of the Psalms in praise to God. They called it the cup of praise. And to us that talks about fulfillment. So the four cups of Passover, the Seder, talk about knowing God, finding freedom, discovering your purpose, and making a difference. And all this flows out of Exodus chapter 6. Go ahead and put that words up. Listen, therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord your God and I will, number one, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. You will know me. I'll bring you out. And number two, I will deliver you. I will bring deliverance to your life from slavery to them. Then number three, this is today, I will redeem you. With an outstretched arm, with a great acts of judgment. And then next week, number four, he says, I will take you to be my people. And I'm going to refrain from getting into that. But next week, I want you to know that God wants you to be a part of an agency through which he is going to bless all peoples on the face of the earth. So those four promises are revealed. So we've been taking them one by one. The first week, I gave you an introduction. God's timeless promises. Pastor Merida talked about the cup of sanctification. Pastor Omar talked about the cup of deliverance. Today, we're dealing with the cup of redemption. Next week's the cup of praise. Today, we're talking about redemption. Now, I want everybody to say that word with me all together at the same time. Are you ready on the count of three? One, two, three. Redemption. Redemption. Wow, that's a pretty big word. That's kind of like one of those churchy words. That's like one of those words you probably didn't hear at Walmart. (laughs) That's probably one of those words you don't don't hear on on the secular uh, media. So we have to understand what the word redemption really means. Now, I grew up in church. Many of you did. If you grew up in church, you may have learned the word redemption. If you didn't, maybe you're not familiar with that word. So let me explain it to you. Webster says that redemption means three things. Number one, redemption means to buy back. It means to repurchase, to clear up a debt, to offer full payment for something. If something was mortgaged, if something was hocked, (laughs) if something was at the uh, pawn shop, you would redeem it. You would go and you would repurchase it and you would buy it back. Secondly, redemption means to change for the better, to reform, to repair, or to rehabilitate. But thirdly, redemption means to restore. And this is the one that really gets me excited. It means to return back to its original purpose and design to fulfill the reason for it was created. So all three of those definitions are in this word of what God did and is still doing for us through Jesus Christ. Number one, we have been bought back with a price. Come on, somebody. We are not our own. We have been bought by the blood of Jesus. It was not with common things. This is what Peter said. Such as silver and gold that you will redeem, but it was by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are bought with a price. You are not your own. The blood of Jesus Christ paid the bill. It's like he became our kinsman redeemer. Read the book of Ruth. And when the mortgage was there and when the property was unpaid for and when Ruth's relatives died and the debtor was about to come and take her children and put them in a debtor slave, there was a kinsman redeemer. There was a Boaz that showed up on that situation and he said, I'm going to write the bill. I'm going to write the payment. I'm going to pay that the debt is paid in full that's what Jesus did for me because I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and then he said I'm going to repair you I'm going to repurpose you I'm going to restore you I'm going to re rehabilitate or reform you but I like to say this 
In the body of Christ, when we come to Him, we are not repaired. Come on, somebody. We are not reformed. We are not rehabilitated. We are not just cleaned up a little bit. We are completely recreated. For any man that is in Christ is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. He changes for the better. But then thirdly, to, re- to redeem means to restore us back to our original design so that we can fulfill our original Purpose. Now look at this definition on the screen, and I wrote this very carefully. God's redemptive plan is to buy us back. Go on up, that might be the next one. To buy you back from slavery to sin, completely recreate you back to what you were intended to be so that you can be restored to your original purpose and design. And there's a word that we use for that process. And that's the word restoration. Restoration. Redeeming us, completely recreating us back to what we were intended to be so that we can be restored to our original purpose. And how many know a picture is worth a thousand words? It's like God would take a car. It's not what it used to be. It's all rusty now. All the parts are there. But it just doesn't look like it once did. It's all rusty now. I don't know if it runs or not. The tires might be flat. This is not my car. I just found this picture. But, uh, but, but there it is. But what God does, he says, I'm going to redeem this car. Go up to the next one. And God may have seen you one day sitting on the side of the road. And God said, you know what? I'm interested in that in that." piece of workmanship there it's not what it used to be it's not quite in all of its former glory but all the parts are there and it sat there for about three or four weeks and nobody really gave it a whole lot of attention but one day God came along and he said how much is it going to cost to to purchase this so I can rebuild it so I can restore it and God said okay that's the price here's the price of the blood of Jesus that thing is paid in full and I'm going to bring it home come on somebody go to the next one I'm going to bring it home I'm going to park it in my driveway and everybody knows that it's in my driveway it's sitting there in my house but then God said even though it's in my house and it's restore and it's uh, it's uh, it's repurchased there's got to be some work done on this thing So what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to start taking parts out of it. Because those parts are there and there's potential. Come on, help me preach this, Dave. And they're all all there. And this thing is going to be restored to its glory. We're going to polish it up. We're going to repaint it. Because God said, when I pulled the hood of that thing and I looked down in there, I saw a treasure underneath that 1970 Mach 1 hood. I saw there was a 351 cubic inch Cleveland engine with a four barrel carburetor. And God said, we're going to clean that thing up and we're going to refurbish it and we're going to put it back in. And when we fire that thing up, it's going to be running on all eight cylinders. Oh, come on, somebody. Rev your motor. That's what I'm talking about. God says, I'm going to fire you up. And you're going to be restored to full viability. So then God says, well, you know, we got to work on the outside a little bit. Because even though you look perfect on the inside, everybody else is looking on the outside. So God says, we're going to put you in the body shop. And we're going to start taking off some parts. And we're going to start cleaning you up. We got to get the interior cleaned up. We got to get the exterior refurbished. We, we got to make sure that everything is clean and sanded and prepared because we're going to put on some color. We're going to put out a spray gun and we're going to turn that thing back because everybody knows every 1971 Mach 1 was intended to be grabber blue. And so God says, we're going to put you back to the color that you were intended and somebody get ready to shout because God says there's going to be a reveal. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians that all of creation awaits for the manifestation of the sons of God to be revealed and God says I'm going to take you home and when I get you at home every day is like Christmas day because I'm going to repurpose you come on turn it up a little bit and you're going to fulfill what your original purpose for design was and that was to do a Holy Ghost burnout 
in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let that go just a little bit more. Now, this was before we put the stabilizer bars on the back. That's why there's so much body sway here on this, on this donut. But come on, somebody. That's what God wants to do for you. Woo! Somebody said, Pastor Coach, that's not very spiritual. I didn't ask for your permission. I didn't ask for my wife's permission to tell this because I thought she would probably say, don't do it. I figured it would be easier to get forgiveness than it would be to get permission. You say, that's not very spiritual. If it happens to you, it's very spiritual. Because God picks you up on the side of the road when nobody else cared, when nobody else was interested, when no one else was willing to fork up 39 cents. But God said, I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to redeem you. And then once you belong to me, I'm going to start working on the inside. And then the inside transformation is going to be revealed on the outside. I know if you missed this while ago because the motor was running, but the Bible says in Romans that all creation awaits for the manifestation of the sons of God to be revealed. In other words, God said there's going to be a day when I'm going to pull you out out of seclusion and I'm going to put you on display and all the world is going to say this is my son this is my daughter created in my image created in my likeness and they are here to give glory and praise and honor to almighty God because he wants to restore he wants to completely restore you to everything that you are intended to be now how many are willing to listen now and learn some things we've had some fun now we're going to learn something here at Family First, we're talking about loving God with our minds. So here it is. Here's my pastor's hat now, my teaching hat. So many people get stranded in the process between cup two and cup three. They find God. They're struggling to get free. But they never get to that point of full redemption. They don't get to that point of restoring back to their original purpose and design. One statistic says that 87%, that's pretty high, 87% of church people, churchgoers in America, never get beyond step two. The reason for that is found in the very promise itself. Look at Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, the last part of the verse. The reason is it takes the supernatural power of God to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. That Mustang could not repair itself. It had to have somebody come along and do the work. You cannot fix yourself. You cannot rehabilitate yourself. I'm not going to go off this morning on a rant, but you can have all the self-help programs. You can read all the self-help books. You can take the 10-step program or the 39-step program. If it doesn't have the supernatural power of God releasing in you your God-ordained purpose, it's not going to be effective because you cannot do it by yourself. God has to do it inside of you. And so God says this, chapter 6, verse 6, God says, I will redeem you. Now look at two ways he does this. Letter A, with an outstretched arm. And letter B, with great acts of judgment. So God says, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do it two ways. I'm going to do it with an outstretched arm. I'm going to do it with mighty acts of judgment or power. Let's take them one at a time. I've got to catch my breath. Number one, God says, I'm going to do it with... An outstretched arm. What's that mean? Why does God have to stretch out his arm? Why did God say to Israel, I'm going to do this with my mighty outstretched arm? That's because Israel, as well as you and I, at one time were so far away from God that we couldn't reach him. So he had to reach us. We were so low. We were so down. We were so humiliated. We were so decimated. We were so broken on our self-portrait. In fact, even if religion told us we need to try to reach up to God, we said we can't do that because Christianity is not man reaching up to God. That's what religion is. Christianity is God reaching down to man. And so God said to Israel, I'm going to do this by my own design. It's not going to be you reaching out to me. It's going to be me with my mighty outstretched arm reaching down to you no matter how low you are 
No matter how far away you are, no matter how broken you are, I'm going to reach down with my mighty right arm and I'm going to pull you up. So Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 says, Remember that you were at one time separated from God, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without Christ and without God in this world. You are lower than a snake's belly. I mean, you are without hope, without God. You are totally in inferiority. This is what this speaks of. God says, my mighty arm is going to reach in and it's going to pull you out of inferiority. So Psalm 40 says, this is the psalmist. He drew me out of the pit of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth. He put a song of praise to our God. And many will see and fear and put their hope in God because he reached out with a mighty hand and he pulled me out of the pit where I was in and he set my feet upon a solid rock. Ephesians 2.10, God wants to make you a masterpiece. I know right now you see yourself sitting on the side of the road all rusted up and not shifting very well and only running on six cylinders. But God sees you as a masterpiece. And this is what the Bible says. We are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ so that we can do the things that he planned for us to do long ago. What's the ultimate restoration? To be fulfilled back to your original design and purpose. And so God says, I'm going to do that. With my outstretched arm. He also says I'm going to do this with what? Mighty acts of judgment. Now listen real carefully. What's this mean? What's this judgment all about? Say, Pastor, what, what's just God judging me? No, the Bible says it's the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. God's not judging us in this verse. What's he judging? Who's he judging? He's judging the devil. He's judging those forces and powers that are opposed to us, that are resisting us, that are trying to get us off the track. And if we understand this, God says, I'm going to bring a mighty act of judgment against devils and evil spirits that try to deter you and divert you from the path into the perfect restoration that I have for you. So this speaks to me speaks of diversion, not just inferiority. That's his right arm that pulls you out of that. But diversion, he says, yeah, Satan has worked a number on you, son. He's got you off track. He's got you diverted. He's allowed pain and hurt and all kinds of tragedy And divorce and bankruptcy and separation and all this stuff. Satan has allowed all that to happen in your life and he's diverted you. How many know God's got a plan for your life? Not a trick question. How many know Satan has a plan for your life? And how many know when God sends... I don't mean to embarrass anybody here this morning. But God sends his people to church on Sunday morning. And sometimes the devil sends his people to church on Sunday morning. And we're here to declare over you today, if you're under the power, I don't know why I'm saying this is prophetic right now. If you're under the power of darkness, I'm going to tell you right now that the power of God can set you free. You can be free. And he whom the sun sets free and free indeed, you may have come just to look. You may have come just to observe. You may have come just to criticize. But the power of Almighty God can transform your life. Forgive and forget ever sin you've ever committed. Make you as ready for heaven as if you're already there. And you can walk out of this place today whole and free as a child of God. Amen. Amen. I thought about this. Satan wants to divert us. He wants to get us off the right track. But God says, my plan is not erased. My plan is not canceled just because you made a few wrong turns. I want you to listen to this. Let's say that the destination is Tampa, Florida. What's the quickest route to Tampa, Florida? Straight south. Suncoast Parkway, straight south to Tampa, Florida. And that won't take very long. But even if you went the wrong way, even if you made some wrong turns, you can still get to Tampa through Ocala. It might take you a while. And you'll have to make a few corrections along the way. 
But if you went out of the parking lot and the GPS was confused and it told you to turn north instead of to turn south, and believe me, Siri does get confused once in a while. Siri, GG, TT, whichever one of those. You have the Tom Tom, you have the Google, you have the Apple, whichever one it is. They make some wrong choices sometimes. But if you're going the wrong way, it, it amazes me. So if you're going the wrong way, you can still get to your destination if you'll do what? If you'll turn around. And I really felt the Holy Spirit explode this in my spirit this week as I'm praying and studying. So many people in this room, listen, if you don't hear anything else tell today, connect with me right now. Satan is telling you God's plan for your life is null and void because you've made a few wrong turns. He is telling you God's destiny for your life will never happen because you've made wrong choices, you've gotten diverted, and you might as well just give up because God can never get you back on course. Let me tell you what, that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. If you're headed the wrong direction, all you have to do is turn around. That's what we call repentance and start going back in the right direction. All you have to do is say, God, I know I took a few wrong turns. I know the pain and the trauma and all the hurt and all the tragedy and all the stuff that was allowed to happen in my life. It got me diverted but I'm going to get back on the right path today because greater is the one that's in me than he that's in the world. And I'm going to believe that God is going to erase the past. He's going to make my future better than the past. I tweeted this out a couple of days ago. I'm not going to drive my car looking in the rear view mirror wondering where I've been all my life. I'm going to drive my car looking through the windshield knowing where I'm going because my future is ahead of me, not behind me. And the best is in the future because of the plan and the purposes of God that God has for my life. Oh, I got to do this. I'm sorry. I just got to do this. Pastor Francisco, stand up. I'm told I don't embarrass you. This is a young man's a pastor in this community. God has called him now to go to Savannah, Georgia and be an associate pastor of a great church. And he calls me dad so I can call him son. And I'm declaring over you right now, prophetically in the name of Jesus, that the best is yet to come. The pains of your past are not a prediction of your future. The hurts that you have been through are not an indication of the purposes of God for you. And I declare right now, the promises of God are yea and amen. He's going to open the door. He's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. He's going to cancel this occult uh, this, uh, attack that is against you. Don't worry about it. Don't be under stress about it. Put your care in the Lord trust in him because God is going to help you and he's going to bring you forth to his divine destiny because his plans are a man and yes to them that are in Jesus go on give God a praise today hallelujah 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 somebody look at this somebody look at Romans eleven twenty nine. God's gifts and God's call are under full warranty get a hold of that not 36,000 or 48,000 or 100. What's those cars you get? 100,000 mile warranty. What, what country do those cars? Anyway, God's, God's warranties never run out of schedule. If something goes wrong, he can fix it. He can put you back on the right path. He can turn you around because the gifts and the callings of God are never rescinded. So I got to hurry this morning, but there's three things that you need to do to pursue and drink this cup called redemption. We're going to lift this cup up today and we're going to drink this full cup of redemption. And it includes perching us back from the ownership of Satan. It it includes reforming us and rehabilitating us, which is actually recreating us. But it also includes restoring us to our original purpose and design so that we can fulfill our original destiny. And what you've got to do is you've got to discover and then you've got to develop and you've got to deploy the gifts that God has put inside of you. I'll do this quickly. There's three places in the Bible that we learn about spiritual gifts. Now, this is like a one-hour spiritual gift seminar in, in about... Three minutes, so listen carefully. In the book of Ephesians, there are what we call ministry gifts. 
That's where Ephesians chapter 4 says it was God who called some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. God said these are ministry gifts to the body of Christ. And I'm not going to linger, but I'm sure glad today that God still has all five fingers on his hand. I don't know if everybody knows what that means, but God is not an amputee. God is not willing to let the church in America, maybe we don't understand the apostles. And maybe we don't understand the prophetic. We understand pastors, teachers, and evangelists. So God's not going to allow us to cut three, two fingers off of his hand just because we don't understand the apostolic and the prophetic. God still has all five fingers on his hand. And he can still use all five members of the five-fold ministry to empower the church, to build up the saints, to do the work of the ministry. And besides, i got to tell you this. Ephesians chapter 4 says that God has called apostles. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do what? To do all the work of the ministry so that everybody else just sits in the pew and shouts amen when the pastor says something good. Wrong. It's so that we can do the work of the ministry. My job's not to do your work. My job's to get you to do your work. (laughs) To equip and to train you to do the work of the ministry. To fulfill the gifts of the calling of God. So there's ministry gifts. And then in 1 Corinthians, there's manifestational gifts. I'm not going to get into that. But those are the gifts of tongues and interpretation and wisdom and knowledge and faith and miracles and all that. But the ones I want to emphasize just a couple of minutes are the motivational gifts of Romans chapter 12. If you've not done so, you need to read Romans chapter 12 again. And in chapters uh, 12 verses 3 through 8... God says there are seven motivational gifts. And I want to give you this quickly. I believe that at the time of your conception, at the time you were conceived in your mother's womb, before you were ever born, the Father, that's God, your Creator, instilled into you a primary and a secondary motivational gift. And those motivational gifts determine almost everything there is to be determined about your life. They determine your personality. They determine your desires. They determine your your talents, even sometimes your abilities, because you'll pursue some things and not pursue others because you're more interested in being proficient in some areas and you're not interested in pursuing talents and, and abilities in other areas. So the motivational gifts, the personality traits, one of the seven, a primary and a secondary, that are put inside of you the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb. They determine the divine design that God has for your life. And if you read Romans chapter 12, you'll see that there's seven of them. There's one that's called prophetic or or prophecy. That doesn't mean telling the future. That doesn't mean, you know, eating (laughs) camels. uh, 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 What what did John the Baptist? Uh, I got his attire. He he wore camels hair. He, he, He ate locusts and wild honey. No, prophetic just simply means you're an articulate person with an ability to speak forcefully and boldly. And God will use you to prophesy to the body of Christ. Others not only are prophetic, but they're also serving. They're, they're ministry people. There's others that are teachers. There's others that are exhorting. That means encouraging. There are some that are giving, and that explains itself. There are some that are good in administration. That means organizing and and leading and and conducting systems. And then there are others that are mercy-motivated people. God bless their hearts. (laughs) Everybody needs mercy-motivated people. Come on, somebody. Mercy-motivated people are compassionate. They're the people that are caring and consoling and loving. So prophetic, ministry, teaching, exhorting, giving, administration, and mercy. There's a primary one of those, and there's a secondary one of those in every one of your lives. And what you got to do is discover it. You don't decide it. You discover it. Because when you discover it, it's going to open up to you. The divine design that God had intended for you from the day that before you were ever born for you to fulfill his destiny over your life. Look at this definition. Motivational gifts are resonant personality traits, abilities and gifts given to us by our creator at the time of our conception in our mother wombs for the purpose of kingdom advancement. Now, 
when you read the uh, list of the motivational gifts, you'll discover that there's no gift of suspicion. <laughs> there's no gift of inspection. <laughs> Some people think that their gift is to inspect everybody else's gifts. Come on, I'm preaching a lot better than you're responding right now. <laughs> Some people think that their job is to make sure that everybody else does their job. No, there, there's no gift of suspicion. There's no gift of, of uh, inspection. And if your idea of leading is a word that starts with the letter B, if you think leading sounds more like bossing, then you haven't begun to understand what the motivational gift called leading is. There's a big difference between leading and bossing. I'm sensing a little pushback right here. I think I'm just going to linger here for a little while. Telling other people what to do is not leading. Try herding some cats sometime. It doesn't go very well. What you got to do is you got to lead the sheep. You can't drive the sheep. You got to lead them. I'm preaching pretty good right now. And I'm going to tell you, there's people in this room that God has called you into leadership in the body of Christ. But the number one thing you've got to learn to be is a servant leader. Because there's no one that's more effective than a servant leader. And a servant leader doesn't say, do what I say. The servant leader says, do what I do. Follow me as I follow after the Lord. Get in line. We're going to fulfill this thing. We're going to work together. It's not about bossing, but it's about leading. And it takes a lot more work to lead than it does to boss. But it's a whole lot more effective and a whole lot more long-lasting. I'm going to get myself a CD of this and listen to it this afternoon. Hallelujah. So discover your gift. And then what do you got to do? Develop your gift. This is huge. So many people are not willing to develop their gift. They'll say things, well, like, if this is what I'm called to do, then I'm just going to do it. And I don't need anybody to teach me. I don't need anybody to show me. I don't need anybody to mentor me. I'm just going to do it. Well, let me tell you what. Your gift, it might be divinely instilled inside of you, but the moment that God put it in you, it was not fully developed. And so you've got to take the seed of the motivational gift and develop it not expect God to just do everything on his own. You've got to do a little bit of work yourself. You've got to develop your gift. You've got to grow your gift. You might be gifted and you might have musical abilities and you might be able to be, be called to, to be up here on this, on this worship team. But if you can't carry a tune in a bushel basket, if you can't tell a time signature from a, a, an, a, an arithmetic plan, if you don't know the difference between the staff and tic-tac-toe, your gift might not be the prophetic leading of the body of Christ in worship. So you need to learn a little bit about music. You need to learn a little bit. Oh, I'll bless this God. They'll just listen to my voice. No, you're walking to the tune of a beat of a different drummer, man. <laughs> and everybody's got to get on the same page. Are you with me? Discover your gift and then develop it. Pastor, somebody needs to go to the hospital and visit those people that are hurting and suffering and they're in such pain. Yeah, but it can't be me. I don't even like sick people. I don't like to be around people. They depress me. Well, then it's probably not your motivational gift to go on a hospital visitation. Are, are anybody connected to some of this? You know, you got to discover your gift, develop your gift. And then what you know to do? You got to deploy your gift. You got to start using it. I know this is probably a bad illustration, but I used to use it and I can't correct myself. Sometimes you've got to get a Nike anointing. Not a, not a good thing right now. But, but, but you've got to just do it. You've got to just do it. Don't wait for somebody to beg you. You know what we taught the people last Sunday in Growth Track? People on the Family First Dream Team, you know what they do? They do things before they're asked. They do more than they're asked. And they do things... Number three, whatever that one is, it's not in my mind right now. But that's what people do. Because they are gifted of the Spirit of God. Do things before you're asked. Do things more than you're asked. I think it's the first one I'm missing. Some of you that were in that class, you're just laughing at me. You're not helping me. You're just sitting there making fun of me. I don't appreciate it, but it's okay. So discover your gift, develop your gift, deploy your gift. You know what happens? The happiest, the most fulfilled 
completed people on the earth are those who serve in the capacity that they were created to serve in. You want to know who the most selfish, the most miserable, the most discouraging, the most humiliating people on the earth are? People that never do anything for anybody else. They live to themselves and only unto themselves. They wrap themselves in their own little cocoon. It's they're the big three, me, myself, and I. And, and that's all their vision is. They're miserable. They're unfulfilled. But you know who the happiest people in the world are? People that discover their divine design and they step into serving in the capacity that God created them to serve. Look at this verse. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gifts. Manage them well so that God's generosity can flow through you. I want to pause here in a minute. I want the band to to come. Pastor Meredith and the team is going to help us here at the end. But there's something that's really on my heart today. And I didn't give this verse of Scripture earlier, so I want to give it to you now. Because I was praying this week, I really felt like this is what the Lord was, was saying today as a rhema word. Some of you were on the right path. You were headed to the right direction. You were pointed south. You were going to Tampa. But for some reason, you turned the wrong direction. For some reason, disaster or pain or some sort of tragedy came into your life and you got diverted. And you're thinking today, Pastor, well, I just lost it and and there's no chance of me recovering it. There's no chance of me now getting back on track. So I'm just going to be happy to stay in step two the rest of my life and just struggle till the day I die to try to find freedom. I know that someday I'll be in heaven with Jesus forever, but until then, it'll just be a miserable life. Because I made a free wrong choices. You know what the Bible says? Romans 8, 28. And we know that God works in all things for the good of them that love him according to his purpose. You know what that means? God didn't make that wrong choice. You did. God didn't ordain you to turn the wrong direction. You made that mistake yourself. But God is willing to help you in that situation and he'll turn it around. Just like it says in the book of Genesis to, about Joseph, what the people did in, when his brothers sold him into slavery, they put him down in the pit, that they sold him to the, the people that were coming through the, the, the land as, as slave owners. What man intended for evil, God will turn it into good so that actually it becomes promotion. And Joseph eventually got to be the second in command in Egypt. He had to go through the pit. He had to go to the prison, but eventually he got in the palace because he realized the giftings and the callings of God are never rescinded. Somebody needs to get hold of that today. Maybe about 15, 20, or 30 people need to get a hold of that today. Because you're saying, Pastor Coates, I, I, I blew it. I missed it. And so the rest of my life, I'm just, I'm just paying my dues. I, I'm, just, I'm just living out the, the regrets of all my wrong choices. Get over it, my friend. And realize the past is behind you. And let God be in front of you. And let Him lead you into His promises. Because the best is yet to come. He's for you, not against you. And there wasn't one day of your life that is forgotten or forsaken because God can help you. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Just just a quick minute, just a quick minute. Everybody needs to process these steps in your life. Number one, you need to know God. If there's anyone in this room today that does not know God, does not have in your life what we call a living person relationship with Jesus, what you need to do is to confess your sin and ask Jesus to come into your life. It's what people have done every Sunday many times to ask Jesus to be the Lord of their life. Secondly, yeah, you need to find freedom. Pastor Omar preached about that last week. And I'm not prophesying that if you found freedom last Sunday, you got to get it all over again this week. Come on, don't live in that broken mentality. Live in the mentality that when you came to the altar last Sunday and found freedom, you still got it. You're still walking in the freedom. But what you've got to do is discover your divine design, even if you made a wrong choice, if you headed the wrong direction, let God turn it around. Amen. I'm going to pray over you today. How many would respond? It might be number one. I don't know. It may be number two. But my heart is really on this third thought. 
Pastor, I'm on the wrong path today. Yeah, I know God. I, I, I'm a Christian. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm walking out my salvation. I, I, I'm growing in grace. I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm walking in the freedom. But I'm not anywhere near the fulfillment of the purpose that God has on my life. So today I'm going to turn around. I'm going to get back on track. And I'm going to fulfill the vis- original intention of the divine design. The reason God made me, I'm going to get back on that track. Is that you this morning? Would you raise your hand? I I just felt there's like 20 or 30 people here this morning that God is saying that to. Get back on the track. Get back on the path. Get back on the the road. To You made a wrong choice. Turn it around. Go back and redo what needs to be fixed and, and realize that God can wipe that all away and He can put you back on the road to destiny in the promises of God. How many others? I'm going to pray over you. Just a minute. How many others? I want to get back on that path today. I'm not saying you're lost. I want you to understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you're away from God. I'm just saying that God has more for you than what you're living out right now. And you're settling for far below God's plan because you think your own mistakes have broken God's plan when God is saying, no, my promises are not changed. There's still yea and amen to them that believe. Would you stand to your feet with me? Everybody in the house standing together, we're going to pray. And then we're going to go out of here on a great shout of victory today. We're going to sing a song of celebration. But would you pray with me right now, everyone in the room? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me lead you and just pray out loud on behalf of our family today. Father God, today in the name of Jesus... I pray for anyone that may be away from you today. I pray for those that have not drank the first cup, the cup of salvation, the cup of sanctification. If they will say yes to God today, he will say yes to them. And I know, Lord, you will come into their lives, forgive and forget every sin they've ever committed. Give them a brand new purpose and destiny. I pray secondly, God, for those that may be still struggling with getting free of the past. And maybe there are addictions and uh, broken choices and all kinds of life debilitating problems that's keeping them from freedom. I speak over them right now. He whom the sun sets free is free indeed. But I'm praying this right now over so many people. Holy Spirit, listen to them and speak to their hearts. Because there was not a day, not one day that God wasn't by your side. There wasn't a day that God forsook you. Even when you went the wrong direction and made the wrong choice, God was still standing there saying, if you'll turn around, if you'll come back home, I'll pick you back up, put you right back on the right path to the fulfillment of your divine destiny, of the purpose of your origin in the very beginning. If you're receiving that today, come on, join with me. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise and a shout and we're going to lift this up to God today. Come on, sing it out.
worship you, Lord. I will worship you. Hallelujah. Father God, today I speak over the family today. I speak over the family, first family today, that they can get back on the right track, regardless of wrong turns, regardless of wrong choices. And they can go in the right direction and know that your divine design has not changed. They're still the person that you originally designed and created them to be to fulfill the purposes of God on their life from the time that they were conceived in their mother's womb. We receive it today with great joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, slap somebody a high five and tell them I'm on track today. I'm on track today. I'm on track today. If you would like prayer, we're going to be in the front for a moment. We would love to greet our guests today in the cafe. May take us a moment to get there, but if you'll stick around, we'd love to greet you there for just a few minutes. Shake your hand and meet you. If you'd like prayer, come to the front. We welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit today to minister to you in a wonderful day today. God bless you as you go.